Good stuff. Well, it's 2 p.m., so I guess now's as good as time as any to get started on uh, our workshop today. Uh, thank you for attending. You are now attending uh, the Resilience uh, Recipe, kind of part one of a two-part series on resiliency that uh, Jason and I are hosting. Um, I guess we'll start with some introductions today. My name is Lee Richard. I'm the International Training Coordinator at Queen's University International Centre, and I'm joining this well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Jason Summers. I'm one of the residence outreach counsellors for Housing and Residence Life. Um, I guess we'll get started. Uh, the, way we'll, the way we'll manage, I guess, uh, this presentation is if you have questions that come up while we're speaking, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and, and chime in. Um, also, we'll be running a chat concurrent to the presentation as well. So if you have any questions or would like to feel free to do it either way. It'll be however you're comfortable with participating um, in the session today. And this is kind of a, a participatory uh, presentation. There will be uh, a, few, uh, a few opportunities for you to uh, maybe share some of your own examples and provide your own input. So feel free, we're, we're looking, forward to, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Um, guess what we'll start, we'll go over some of the goals that we have for today. So for this workshop, for part one of the two part series today, we're going to develop uh, and uh, develop appreciation of resiliency and also learn some of the ingredients of a resilient mindset. I guess the first kind of question that we'll tackle um, is just try to wrap our heads around what do we mean when we refer, when we refer to resiliency. Um, so when we're talking about resiliency during this, uh, during this session, we kind of have like a, a two-part definition. One is the ability to cope. Oh, my bad. The ability to cope or manage high levels of ongoing stress and recover from setbacks that we may have in our life. And also the ability to recover from misfortune or change. And the, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Jason. Uh, the other aspect that some people might be asking is why uh, resiliency is important and for kind of how we are framing resiliency, we think the parts that are most important um, is it can help maintain mental health. So when the way that we're speaking about resiliency is kind of working through the stresses of life, um, being able to kind of adapt in that way. So for that reason, it helps maintain mental health is our first reason. The second reason in which resiliency is important is tied to um, this concept called burnout. So we will sometimes hear the term burnout um, in which the, what we're talking about is when stress is high for a really long time, we feel more tired. We feel like we don't want to participate as much. Um, and we're just kind of like done with school or we're done with those tasks. Well, as we build resiliency, we can help um, avoid that burnout process. And in time, it also helps us feel more successful when we do have those successes along the way. And finally, resiliency is important as it helps us to process the stress of everyday life, um, especially knowing that as an international student, um, the day-to-day -day life can be quite stressful, the things that, and the expectations that are put upon an international student. Um, I think Lee will kind of move into the next part. I think also wanting to highlight um, that we are recording this aspect of the webinar. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind. If you're uncomfortable speaking because it's gonna be recorded for later, that's totally okay. If um, kind of being on the call is something that's uncomfortable for you knowing that it's being recorded, we will make 
feel free to email us. We'll provide our emails at the end and we can send along a copy of the webinar at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what we'd like to do at this point is just uh, try to add some extra emphasis about just how prevalent, I mean, um, issues and challenges regarding resiliency can be. I mean, stress is very, very prevalent, especially I guess in, in light of circumstances, especially um, with the, the move for social. A lot of us now may feel more isolated than we ever have. And I, you know, part of lacking that social connection can maybe to help mitigate some of the stress in our lives. But one way that we're going to try to emphasize just how common it is to have uh, challenges uh, with, uh, with building resiliency, we're going to do a quick cahoot. We're going to do a quick cahoot. So at this point, we'll ask. And Lee, I think you might be cutting out a bit. A quick, what's that? <laughs> you might be cutting out a bit. Oh, really? So if we can set up what the cahoot is, um, if you're able to on your phone go in, or on a separate uh, web page going to kahoot.it, it's a bit of an interactive uh, quiz. Sorry, back to you, Lee. Thank you, Jason. So we'll bring this up. So if you were able to successfully make it to kahoot.it, it's first going to ask us for a code, which will come up soon. And then we get to come up with nicknames. I like the music, so I'm not going to turn off completely. But <laughs> So the code for today's Kahoot? It's four two one zero eight zero eight. Oh, we are up to two players. Two. Five. Oh, we're flying. It's exciting. I can't wait to see how people do. We'll just give it a couple more seconds. For sure. And maybe if we get started. Oh, yeah, sounds good. And we'll start now with the first question here. So. Five questions, are you ready? Every year, what number of people will experience reduced mental health? We have four choices here. We could just, oh, there they are. So the first choice, one in 10. Our second choice is one in seven. Choice three is one in eight. And choice number five, or choice number four is one in five. And the correct answer was one in five people. Okay, so I think it'll show us the rankings there. So quite prevalent. That's, well, it's a fifth of the population. Mm -hmm. Congratulations oh. to Kayla, an early lead. And I think you also get points for how quickly schools well. Mm -hmm. Next question. What are some of the reasons that prevent international students from accessing mental health assistance? So you concerned there's enough time in their schedule, unsure where to access assistance, concerned perhaps that others will find out that they asked for help, or option four, all of the above. Option green square, all of the above. Oh. Most of you got it right. Correct. Yeah. The uh, correct answer is all of the above. A multi, multi faceted reason, we should say, as to why 
sometimes the international students are hesitant to uh, act as mental health uh, assistants. Mm -hmm. Technically, everyone got it right. I it guess just. <laughs> Next. Oh, by the age of 40, what percentage of the population will experience a mental health and their uh, mental illness in their lifetime? You have 10 percent, 17 percent, 50 percent, or 30 percent. And I think in this way, talking about mental illness is kind of mental health that is causing disruption in an area of life. For sure. And correct answer was 50%. So that's a huge part of the population. So mm -hmm. mental illnesses are, are quite common, quite common. Kayla's on fire? Kayla is on fire. But Oma's coming in fast, I guess. Okay. Next question. The factors that can affect mental health illness, uh, mental health, I should say, include we have genetics, personality, environment, or all of the above. And in turn, these are factors that will influence our resiliency. Absolutely. Oh, it looks like everybody got it right. Great. Yeah, and by no means is this a, a comprehensive list as well. There are many other aspects that affect uh, mental health, but these are some of the major ones for sure. Kayla's still doing really well. Okay, congratulations. She's on a streak with four answers in a row. Okay, last question. What percentage of Ontario University students rate their stress as more than average or tremendous? Got 58%. 42%, 27%, or 13%? Let's see. And the correct answer is 50%. So 58%. Prevalent. The stress amongst uh, post secondary uh, populations. So let's see. We have a little bit of a podium. <laughs> yeah. Two is coming in at number three. Oma is number two. And number one, let me guess. Kayla. Congratulations, Kayla. Five out of five. Oh, we got the runner up, runners up with BX and B5 as well. So the reason we wanted to kind of touch on that is this idea of even just showing how prevalent stress can be or kind of high stress can be um, as university students as, as students are at as university students. Um, and as that is something that is really tied to um, resiliency. For sure. So as we uh, mentioned at the beginning of, of the work of this uh, session as well, like Challenges with building and maintaining resilience are quite are quite common. So if you find yourself in a in a time of stress right now, by no means um, feel that you're alone. It, it's it's quite common. Um, at this point, what we'd like to do is maybe just drill down kind of a little deeper into some of the stressors that might be affecting international students, but I guess also uh, students in general. Right now, and we've come up with a with a list of a few different. Um, of a few different reasons here. This list is by no means exhaustive. I mean, there, there could be, every situation is gonna be different depending on the individual, but for, for international students, especially with the culture of moving, uh, or I should say with the stress of moving into a new culture, there can be a lot of tension and opportunities uh, for your resilience to be compromised during that experience. The experience of moving to a new culture, having get to get used to a new uh, new set of rules, maybe for for interacting, also getting used to a new set of rules for it, for maybe a new institution as well. Perhaps for for some students, this is their first time to attend post secondary as well. 
can be moving from, let's say, the academic culture of high school and moving to university for the first time and getting used to that. But also the stress that comes with all well, moving to a new geographic location, having to situate yourself, to have to learn how to find your way around your, your new home and your new environment. Um, there can be also financial worries as well. I mean, post-secondary is quite expensive for international students. Um, so there can be a lot of financial stress that can come into tied in with that as well. Awesome. I'm, we're going to read, Jason, while we, while we read through it, would you mind adding in a, maybe some of the uh, input that's coming through the chat as well? Uh, so, so far, no input through the chat, um, but language has come up. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, language for sure. Adapting and learning a, a maybe a new language can definitely be stressful as well. Um, there's also the stresses of being away from your familiar uh, uh, your social circles and your support groups. Being away from friends and family can be can be very stressful. Um, maybe not so much for myself, but I moved to Kingston about three years ago, and I know I had definitely some stress trying to build a new social circle and and find uh, new friends that, that could uh, support me. Mm -hmm. For international student populations on campus as well, there's definitely trauma that could come in from experience racism and discrimination on campus as well. Whole experience of maybe feeling that they don't fit into the campus or the local community. All these can be very traumatic and can cause a lot of stress and do a lot to degrade and compromise our aptitude for resilience that we might already have. Anything you want to add to that, Jason? Uh, not too much to add, but I think that's a really great point. Um, I know it can be, there's just so much change in coming um, to study abroad or to study in a different country, yep. um, but also recognizing that there's a lot of, and what something we'll talk about is there's a lot of strengths that come with that as well. I think the one thing I'll add I think just from I'm thinking about for myself right now some of the stress. Oh wait, we're gonna do that in the next slide. Never mind. I'm skipping <laughs> ahead. This tends to happen. Um, one question we'll throw to you. Oh, Beatrice also added different social norms. Absolutely. Oh nice. Um, yes. They change from culture to culture. It can be very stressful figuring out what those new social norms and expect expectations may be. Because unfortunately, with the transferring to a new cultural environment or new culture in general, often we learn about those new norms, often the hard way through trial and error, and making mistakes um, through pure frustration as well. Um, one question we'll throw out, though, and this is kind of like a, an interactive piece. I mean, what stresses for any of you do you find that maybe you're currently experiencing? Um, I can add my own example. I think right now, especially with the move uh, during social distancing and the move in the move to working from home, um, it's. I just realized you can see the mess in the background in my place. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So spending definitely spending more time in in I guess in my case my disorganized uh, apartment. But yeah, getting having to get used to like new ways of of structuring my work day, trying to stay trying to stay productive, being away from, I guess, the social contact uh, contacts I had on campus as well. That's definitely um, been part of the stresses I've experienced. I think for myself, it's finding new ways to exercise. I was someone who really liked team sports and going to the gym, uh, two things that are not possible in today's climate. Um, so thinking of what are new ways to do that has been a bit of a source of stress for me. Yeah, I kind of miss exercising as well. Well, <laughs> the input has been overwhelming. Don't everyone answer at once. No, but that's fair enough. This is a, this is a low pressure uh, session. Um, but one thing, kind of one takeaway we'll give you at this point is the experience of stress can often be can often be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. A way to help, I don't want to say mitigate your stress, but to start uh, to start to manage your stresses, we'll think about what are the specific points, maybe in your life right now, 
that you feel are causing you stress. By being able to narrow it, narrow it down and consider where the, where, the, where the stress may come from, that can help to, um, that can help to uh, be maybe a good first step to uh, learning how to manage them. Oh, thank you, Omar. Uh, assignments and deadlines during COVID work burden in hospital, yeah. No, I, I don't doubt it. No, absolutely. A very temporary context. Okay, thank you for sharing, Omar. Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely stresses, professional stresses. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obligations as well. I mean, be a professional or academic as well. Learning how to meet those obligations and responsibilities in the new COVID environment that, that we're experiencing. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Omar. Did I miss anything, Jason? Uh, that is what I had from the chat as well. That's good. Okay. And the reason we kind of want to wanted to spend some time on the self reflection about stress is the reality that high stress situations does make resiliency harder. Um, when we're feeling higher stress, we're often going to be feeling emotions like anxiety or fear or sometimes even frustration or anger, and that's okay. Um, but ways that we can begin to name and work with those stress can help us with resiliency. Also recognizing that a feeling of loss of control makes resiliency really difficult. We want to use our resiliency to move towards goals in the future. But if I feel like I don't have as much control over how those goals come to be, it can be really difficult um, to want to work towards them. And then finally, when we're talking about kind of lack of opportunities to check in with yourself, what I mean by that is taking the time to self-reflect and taking the time to, you know, even to check into how I'm feeling or how I'm thinking or what I've been through in the last little bit. The more we're able to do that, um, the more that we can be able to kind of realize what we want to do in the future and kind of work through the different stresses of life towards those goals. Nope. Absolutely. It kind of ties back to the last slide as well. By, by, by taking time to, uh, to check in with yourself and understand where, where and pinpoint where the stresses in your life are coming from, that can, that can help. That can be a good first step to, to mitigating that stress. Because again, and the, the experience of stress can be quite overwhelming when, when it does hit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just bear with me. So next we'll move on to, well, now we're gonna kind of consider, well, what can be some of the, the different ingredients of maybe a resilient mindset? What can we do to kind of take those first steps? Um, and by no means is this an exhaustive list, but these are going to be some of the, uh, some of the different ingredients that we're gonna to cover today. But some of the uh, different ingredients for the, re the resilient minds that we're going to cover today are include well self-reflection. We'll be kind of just touched upon a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. Learning how to build or strengthen our trust in ourselves. Also, considering how we can create meaning or draw meaning from uh, from our lives right now, and also learning how we're placing emphasis on paying attention to our emotions, especially when we're in a period of uh, of stress. And last but not least, we'll. Uh, kind of tie it towards problem solving skills, but this will also tie into part two of this presentation as well. Is there anything uh, that I missed, Jason? No, I think that's great. And I think we're ready to move into our first ingredient of resiliency. Are we? Right on, okay. So, and that first ingredient- yeah, There are many, oh, we can just kind of repeat what the first ingredient is. Oh, for sure, yeah. Appreciate uh, that, that uh, there are, m that you're more than just a student, that there are many facets to your life. To appreciate that, that while there may be one point of stress that's coming, uh, one point of stress is coming from a specific uh, point in your life right now, 
to realize that you have many roles in your life that you may be doing quite well and not quite realize yet. So the second, the second kind of reflection point we'll add here is, we're well, gonna ask you, and this can be, you don't necessarily have to do this now, but just something to consider. This can be one of the, uh, a takeaway from the session as well, but consider an identity cloud for yourself. Think of all the different roles that you, that you are filling in your life right now, all the different roles that you play, the different duties that you fill. For example, I think we've added ours here. I've added my kind of identity cloud or more identity wheel that is. And I've included all the different roles I kind of feel that I'm uh, filling in my life right now. Let's see, I've included my, my professional identity up in the top corner of maybe a training coordinator. I have my family identity as a son right now, maybe a social identity as a friend. I have a couple of maybe my personal identities, my hobbies right now, home improvement, doing more of that recently, also as a cyclist. But I want to consider myself as a multifaceted person to not just focus on one aspect of my life. Um, I think we have a slide for you as well, Jason. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed, yeah. Yes, yeah, so mine is very similar. Um, and I, in taking the time to maybe in this session or even on your own to kind of create your own identity wheel the purpose is, you know, if I think to when I was a student, um, one of my identities certainly was, I was a biology student at the time. Yeah. And there were times when I was doing quite well in school, but there were also times when I wasn't, uh, mainly when math was involved. And in those times, if I'm really focused on only one aspect of my identity, it feels like I'm failing and it feels like nothing is working out for me. And it's taking that time to reflect and remember, you know, I'm not just a biology student or I'm not just someone taking calculus, but I'm also a friend or a son or playing ultimate Frisbee in different sports or someone who really likes trivia. And I can excel in those aspects of my life, even though I might be frustrated with one part. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me right now, I guess, as I mentioned with the move, uh, to working from home, maybe I have less confidence now in my professional identity, so to speak, because it's a learning curve. I'm getting used to doing new things. But now, I guess now that there's more time for communication, I, I've built up more confidence in my family identity as a son now because I'm keeping in, in more constant contact with my family across Canada and my friends abroad as well. So the important thing is to kind of Look, look for balance, not to overfocus on one, one specific aspect of your life that may be causing you stress. Um, another ingredient, and this kind of ties into our last point as well, is but to build trust in yourself. Even though there may be one aspect or one role in your life where you feel that you don't have quite control over or it's not going as well as you would like, um, um, consider the other the other roles uh, that in your life that may be going that you feel that you are doing well that we're, that you are drawing strength from where you are having success, and use that to build up the trust in yourself. Use that as kind of like a starting point for your resilience. Know and trust that just because maybe you may be temporarily frustrated in one aspect of your life, that there are maybe there's definitely others that maybe you're not paying as much paying as much attention to as you should. Look towards those roles to. And I think overall to get a holistic picture of where um, your mental health might be as well, in, con in considering where your points of stress may be coming from as well, especially if you find your stress overwhelming, also consider well, if there's aspects in your life that you feel least com uh, less confident, let that be your first step in maybe self-assessment and self-reflection and mindfulness to know perhaps where the points of stress in your life are coming from. But overall, the important thing is to remind yourself that you do have, there are points in your life right now, even if you are feeling stressed, that you do have control over and that there are, mm -hmm. that, that, that there are points that are working well for you. Anything that I missed there, Jason? No, I think that's great. And I think it also helps us remember that 
you know, when times get tough in certain aspects, I feel like I'm only a student when in reality, yeah. I'm a much more complete person. That's a good point. You know, it's very easy in times of stress to overfocus and fix it on the one aspect in our lives mm -hmm. that we feel that are not going well. Um, in building out that self-confidence, though, I mean, also be mindful and pay respect and honor the, the, to what you've accomplished already in, 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 your, in your lives. Um, for example, if you're a student Queens, well, I mean, you've reached, you have the skills and knowledge to attend an institution such as Queens. I mean, it's not necessarily an easy uh, uh, institution to get into, so you've obviously proven yourself that way. Um, you also have some steps towards building self-awareness and building your resilience unto itself. You've shown the curiosity to attend a session like this. So it kind of takes solace in that, that you're taking the first steps to kind of build your resilience to begin with. Um, for the international students who are attending, um, you should also honor the bravery that's inherent in the, uh, in the dedication and the commitment to becoming an international student to begin with. It, it's not an easy choice to make and the experience itself can be very trying. The fact that you've made that decision and committed to it and have made it this far is something that you should take great pride in. Um, I feel I was an international student once myself and, and it's an experience that I always carry, uh, that I always carry with me and I still take pride into this day. Um, you also want to consider uh, just to pay respect to also how far you've came. I mean, depending on how long you've uh, been at Queens now, think about, look back to when you first, when you first arrived or when you first started your, um, your education here at Queens. How confident were you when you first started? And compare that to where you are now. Um, perhaps maybe you're not as confident, but I mean, but just remember that you have done, a, you have put in a lot of work and that you have gone through a learning process. You're definitely further ahead now than when you first started on the process. Um, I'm thinking back to when I started grad school. I remember the first day, the first day of classes, I looked around and thought, who let me into, who let me in here? What am I doing with all these very smart people? Um, but then after a while, I eventually finished and realized, okay, maybe I was being a little too hard on myself at the mm. beginning. For myself, it was even having um, confidence in not getting lost on campus. Yeah. I went to a smaller university, um, a satellite campus of the University of Toronto. Okay. And I remember the first day I spent about half an hour getting lost, which um, was impressive because you can walk from one end to the other of the campus in five minutes. But over time, it was something where I, by the end, I knew the campus like the back of my hand or very easily. But it took time, right? It took time. Yeah, it's a learning process for sure. It took a lot of getting lost. But in general, the, the main thing is get, if you're feeling if you're feeling like you have a lack of control of your life at, at this point, also give credit to yourselves for the, the amount of work and progress that you've made thus far. Don't forget, don't, how can I say, don't forget to remember that, as they say. Next ingredient we'll look at is creating meaning, uh, looking for meaning and creating meaning in your life. And kind of talking about why meaning is important. Um, and for me, meaning is important because it is something that motivates or drives us through those tough times. If I care a lot about something, it's very daunting, but it is something that I will want to complete. I think about uh, when I started my undergrad education, I really wanted to um, kind of help in the environment. I really wanted to work as what's called a naturalist. And it was something that was meaningful to me, but also really hard to remember why I started the program at the beginning when I was in classes that were really tough for me. Um, I ended up not doing well in first year calculus. It was a big struggle for myself. And during those times, it was hard not to overly focus on everything is about this one quiz. When in reality, I wanted to look a little bit more towards what I was working towards, what I wanted to be kind of five years from now. 
Now, I think another thing to highlight is meaning and values can change over an undergrad career. Um, as I thought about it more, something that people may have picked up on is I currently am not um, a naturalist, although I do have a degree in biology. <laughs> I decided that, you know, I found a lot of meaning in helping people. So that's something that I wanted to work towards and kind of make sure that I was um, putting my effort into. So one question we'll throw out to you, or to the cohort, uh, to our attendees today. Are there any aspects in your life that maybe you find that you're drawing meaning from now? Or perhaps maybe has what you've drawn meaning from, has it changed over time, especially in uh, kind of the new new reality of social distancing in, in, uh, in COVID-19? You know, it, <laughs> <laughs> it is a low pressure. Um, it, it, this is a low pressure presentation. So if you don't feel comfortable sharing well means, but one takeaway we'll ask you to consider though, maybe consider where do or where could you draw meaning from your life currently? What could help you to maybe work your way to uh, understand why you started this path and give you the motivation to continue? I'm trying to think where I draw meaning from right now. I think my the main point I learned I'm drawing meaning from right now is learning how to cook better. Nice. Obviously not cleaning my apartment. <laughs> but I should say also reconnecting with family during uh, self-isolation as well has definitely added some meaning uh, to, uh, to my life as well. I okay. spent a lot more time playing music. Oh yeah, you mentioned that. Good, yeah, developing new skills can definitely, can definitely add meaning as well. So. Our next kind of ingredient in the resiliency recipe um, we've called paying attention to our emotions and something that I talk about a little bit in therapy is this idea that our thoughts, our behaviors and our emotions all influence each other. If I am more nervous or I am more worried about a situation, I often think I go to like thinking almost too rationally and trying to like plan everything out. I also might begin to tell the future. So I've already decided what's going to happen if this doesn't go right. And the, what we find though, is the more we're able to pay attention to our emotions or name different thoughts that are coming up, that can actually help us slow down and be able to almost take that deep breath and be more grounded in thinking about ways that we can work through the problem. Another aspect that comes up um, is that different cultures often dictate which emotions are quote unquote good and which emotions are quote unquote bad. And in my opinion, you know, we don't really have control about which emotions come up, but if I'm feeling more stressed, and I think that being nervous or being scared about a test is the wrong way to think about it, then it's going to make it a lot more difficult to approach that task because it almost adds an extra layer of um, worry tied to working through things. Anything What's to add, Lee? No, it's a good point. I'm just thinking about it myself. I mean, sometimes it seems that there's an emphasis on I'm thinking about crying. Crying is seen as a negative thing to do, you know, in kind of the cultures I'm used to. But why? Why should being sad or having a visceral kind of physical reaction to your sadness, why should that be negative? I think it's a way that we have to think, I think, pay respect to our, our emotions and our feelings, whether they're positive or negative, and honor them either way. If we try to ignore the aspects of stress in our lives or push them away, it's just, it's not going to help in the long run. You have to acknowledge the stresses and sadness that you have in your life because that's the only way you can really, one of the, or I shouldn't say the only way, the <laughs> one of the most effective ways of working through it. 
I just want to add, um, Beatrice was kind enough to, to add some input in regards to, uh, in regards to drawing meaning. And she has a very good point. And this kind of ties into your point as well, Jason, about, you know, where you see yourself in five years. That if you can have, if you have an awareness of self about the type of person you're working towards or the type of person you want to be or the position you want to be in, that can definitely be a, a good way, a strong way of, uh, of creating the meaning of your life, of knowing what you're working towards. Um, if I misrepresented uh, um, your input, Beatrice, please let me know, but uh, that's kind of how how I interpret it, but I think, yeah, that's an excellent point. Our next slide is more just tied to, again, how our feelings or our emotions tend to influence our thoughts or our cognitions. And, you know, that also plays with our actions or our behaviors. Um, for people who may have experienced CBT therapy before, uh, the C is cognition or thought, the B is behavior, and the, oh, I missed one. Did you? The T is thought. Cognitive behavior, nope, therapy. <laughs> so it's tied to um, those aspects being intertwined. And, you know, ignoring one part is often going to influence the other two. But if we move to kind of our next slide. You know what? We have a, we have another question. Oh, uh, great! Jason. So one question that came in is: To what degree should we uh, or should we pay attention to our emotions? Is there a point where there can be too much? I think sometimes um, there is the what I will hear from clients is. You know, if I really pay too much attention to this fear, it's going to really, like, stop me from doing anything. Um, so I think it's a really great question in that way, because that's, that's not what we want in resiliency. What I would say is um, to totally ignore those emotions often comes up in different ways. Um, we want to find ways in which we are experiencing and maybe processing our emotions um, rather than trying to avoid. However, if I find myself in a space where I try to pay attention to my emotion and it becomes too much for me, I would encourage you in those spaces, um, if you feel comfortable, to think of different people who could help me out with that. And that could be counseling at Queens. That could be maybe if there's a close friend or family member that I feel comfortable speaking these types of things out with. Um, or a helpline or different things. We talk about in therapy, and I think it comes up in this slide, but there's this little phrase called, if you can name it, you can tame it. Um, so even being able to say that I feel anxious right now helps me have a little bit of more control over that emotion instead of it kind of growing as this big shadow that looms in the back. I'm not sure if hopefully that answers the question a little bit, um, but certainly I love the question. And if there's anything you'd like to add, Lee. You know, I think you nailed it. I mean, it, it, it's tough. I can only speak from my own experience. And I know in the past when I've experienced stress, and felt overwhelmed it, it's sometimes it's a it's a hard decision when you have to decide well is this aspect of my life or is this stress is, is it taking over to a certain extent is it starting to encroach or get in the way of maybe the other roles you know if i think about my life as like kind of like identity will just starting to encroach or affect the, the other roles that i have in my life i mean for example your life as a student, I mean, or perhaps I'm thinking back on my life as a student as well, <laughs> the stress that I had in grad school, I mean, it started to encroach on, you know, my personal relationships and the relationships I had with my friends and, and family. I mean, a little bit of that is okay, but I mean, if you start to feel that you feel miserable all the time, or that one aspect of your life is taking over, at least I can only speak to my own experience, but I think to me that was kind of like an indicator well, maybe I have to look at um, 
I'm dedicating more and more too much time to this uh, to this aspect of this stress, and now I have to maybe look at, to outside help to help me to to uh, to um to overcome this problem. Another question: Can you say? Uh, can we address um, a little about emotional intelligence? Mm. Good question. I, I think it's a great question. I want to make sure I'm speaking to, if I don't answer your question, I would love a follow-up or we would love a follow-up. Um, but for me, I think sometimes with emotional intelligence, it's even just having, taking the time to self-reflect and put a name to the emotion means a lot. And for some people or in different situations, that's easier than others. For myself in therapy, sometimes people will come in and I'll be like, how are you feeling? And they're like, I don't know. And so it's even taking the time to, I have in my office what's called a feelings wheel. Um, I think if you Google feelings wheel, it's one of the first pictures that comes up. But even taking the time to be like, I'm feeling something and then reflect kind of to name the different things that are on that wheel that I'm feeling. Again, having that name to them is like, I am feeling frustrated or I am feeling maybe even it's jealousy or something. And that allows us to be a little bit more able to work with those feelings, but also even be a little bit more compassionate to ourself. Yeah, I would feel jealous in this situation because I wanted a higher test grade. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but if there's any follow-ups, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, no, absolutely. If there are questions after uh, or during, please feel free for input. From, I can just speak to the, you know, the small amount of reading I've done on emotional intelligence as well, but I guess it's also an ability to, to recognize the important influence that emotion has in our lives and in our interactions, I think often it's overlooked. I mean, we all, ultimately, we all are emotion, emotional beings, and we can't we can't avoid letting uh, letting our emotions kind of affect and influence the way we see the world and where we interact with others. And sometimes, I think that this part can be ignored. I mean, there's uh, oh, sometimes you know when some we refer to someone as being emotional it's sometimes seen as a negative right we're seeing it as that maybe they're not being logical or or straightforward in the way that they think but i think part of emotional intelligence is being able to recognize and honor and be able to communicate in a way that pays respect to the uh, influence of emotion both in our lives and, and for others as well um but yeah that was kind of my view and i think let's see if again, if any questions come up, please feel free to input them in the chat as well. Or if you would like your your microphone um, unmuted as well, please feel free to request. And I guess and then, you kind of touch. Oh, sorry. Go <laughs> ahead, Jason. Yeah, we did touch on this uh, with those great questions that came in, um, but wanted to highlight again that some things that we can pay attention to is. You know, are there common ways that we tend to think when we're more stressed? I get really action oriented, um, whether that's those are actions that are actually helping me or not, or if I'm just cleaning my apartment for the eighth time this week. Um, and then for certain clues that I'm stressed. So for myself, I tend to be very sociable, but I can get a little bit more quiet or ask for help less when I'm feeling stressed. I'm thinking for myself. I know when there's a point in my life or an aspect of my life for maybe one of my roles that I'm starting to, that's maybe causing me stress. I know for myself, I tend to fix it and I'll think about it a lot. I'll think about it all the time. Then I know that definitely I'm moving into a period of stress. Um, when I'm having very high stress, especially in the moment, I can I can recognize that I forget to breathe as they say my breath becomes very shallow 
I'm not doing the full breath from my stomach from the diaphragm and um, then I can re when I when I when I notice myself doing that I realize okay Lee you're kind of in a period of stress here maybe you're not um, thinking about the situation or this interaction completely rationally but it, it's hard to do as we talked about you know, the influence of emotions I mean we can't always be ra uh, rational all the time right okay let's see here Kind What's of our first clue? <laughs> if anyone wants to f share about or add input about how to uh, what the, what their uh, clues are when they feel stressed, uh, feel free to input that as well. And this brings us a little bit to our wrap up slide a little bit, uh, but just again wanted to touch in on how what we talked about begins to build resiliency. So if I'm taking the time to self-reflect and look into my strengths or kind of ways that I'm succeeding in my different identities, maybe taking the time to check in on how different tasks are gonna be helping me in the future with my goals and the meaning in my life, taking stock of and getting space to my different emotions and with different problem solving skills, these can help us through those more stressful times in school and help us work through those tougher times. Now, um, we didn't talk, I was gonna say as much, but we didn't talk at all about problem solving skills, but that is the topic and what we'll be focusing on in next week's presentation. Um, we're gonna be taking these kind of ingredients to resiliency and how can we apply them and almost make our own personal plan for when times get tough to remind ourselves and what is kind of the unique things that help us out? Excellent. Um, yeah, so please feel free to join us next week as well. Um, before we uh, part for today, we do want to share just a couple slides for resources on campus. Um, of course, mental health is very important, and there are resources on campus that you can uh, that you can access um, for international students. We we encourage you if you if you feel that you find that you uh, do need some help, feel free to uh, interact with our international student advisors here at Quick. You can reach them through the email address listed here. Also, we uh, highly recommend that you get in touch with. Uh, Student Wellness Services, if you'd like to make an appointment with an experienced point, uh, personal counselor, you can find the contact information here. If you go this too quickly and you would like this slide deck sent to you, please feel free to reach out to us after, uh, after today's presentation. Um, and also a new, something new that student, uh, student Wellness Services is offering now is a support group for racialized students on campus. Um, I think the only thing that they ask is if you could register, if you're interested in attending, if you are a racialized student and you would like to attend, they ask you to please register in advance and you can register through the link listed here. Um, there are also services that are available through, uh, through Queens as well, off-campus services primarily through, uh, through um, accessing help by phone or through text. And there's a few here that we've listed, Empower Me, Good to Talk, and also a local uh, crisis line that's available here locally in Kingston. because it's kind of a bit strange. <laughs> um, if you've experienced racism on campus, by all means, please get in touch with the human rights advisor through the human rights office. They can be contacted through um, a There's also a phone number here that you can, uh, you can contact. Um, if you've experienced sexual violence on campus, please get in touch with Barbara Lotan. She's available Monday through Friday can find her phone number here and also her email address. Again, if you'd like these slides, feel free to contact us and we can send you the slide deck after the fact. And the Alma Mater Society offers a peer support program as well. Um, and you can contact them by phone through the phone number listed here. But also sometimes getting uh, building up social contacts can be a good way to make it stress as well. If that's if you're looking for social opportunities, by all means, Quick offers an English conversation uh, group program open to everyone on campus. You can 
find more information through the, uh, through the web address listed at the bottom here. Again, if you'd like more information, feel free to contact us after, the, uh, after today's presentation as well. Oh, thanks, Jason. I see you added that in the chat. That's great. Um, before we wrap up for today, um, are there any questions in general? Please feel free to ask. Maybe in the meantime, while we're waiting for potential <laughs> questions, Jason, what did you have for lunch today? I had a salad. You had a salad. Just salad? Um, I mean, it had vegetables and pecans in it. Okay, yeah, pecans sound good. Okay, it's a very healthy lunch. I, I did not eat healthy yesterday. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I do that too. Just catch it up. <laughs> I'll do the same thing. I'll try to balance out my diet through the week. But so far, I have a lot more balancing to do. Okay, well, for the sake of time, I mean, we did, we did list the workshop as one hour. And if, if uh, participants here have other uh, obligations, we don't want to keep you, uh, keep you away from them. Um, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out after uh, today's presentation as well. And please feel free to join us next week. But otherwise, uh, I'll type it out as well. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye, Jason. <laughs>